you've ever felt the warmth of sun on your face, you've experienced the phenomena that causes global warming. The sun's rays come down and the molecules in your skin absorb that energy, entering an excited state. They then relax and release some of that energy as heat. That's what you experience as warmth. Now, when the sun's rays enter our atmosphere from space, they're mostly in the ultraviolet invisible range. They hit the surface of the Earth and then lose some of that energy and shift into the infrared. That outgoing infrared radiation is in the sweet spot for absorption by molecules like methane, or CH4, and carbon dioxide, or CO2. These molecules have beautiful motions called vibrational and rotational motions that um, and the energy transitions associated with those movements overlap with the outgoing energy of the solar radiation trying to leave Earth. Those molecules absorb that light and re-radiate some of it back to space and some of it back to Earth as heat. That's the greenhouse effect. Methane, pictured on the left, has a central carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms, and that geometric arrangement gives it the ability to interact with outgoing infrared energy. Carbon dioxide, in contrast, has many fewer atoms around its central carbon atom and fewer modes or dance moves. Now, this simple consequence of geometry means that a pound of methane will warm the Earth about 120 times more than a pound of CO2 in an instant. Cumulatively, despite being over 230 times more dilute in the atmosphere, methane will warm the Earth as much as carbon dioxide over the next decade. So why haven't we emphasized this? Well, the simple reason is that methane is a short-lived climate pollutant. This means that methane does its damage early, and after about 12 years, it's converted to CO2 or biomass through natural processes. That's why this top line flattens out. In contrast, CO2 has a low and slow warming effect, lasting over 1,000 years in the atmosphere. This longer timescale of CO2 warming means that CO2 reduction and mitigation efforts, while critical and absolutely necessary, cannot change the rate of climate change for at least another 50 years. And that's even if we plummet to zero CO2 emissions today. But what if we could take that methane and turn it into CO2? We'd functionally force that top curve down closer to the lower one, and that would reduce the total warming felt by the Earth. And remember, because methane is so much more dilute, it contributes a minuscule fraction to the total CO2 in the atmosphere and the associated climate forcing. If we can reduce methane emissions or convert the equivalent of 45% of those emissions per year by 2030, we could change the rate of climate change in our lifetimes, saving a half a degree centigrade by 2100. That's a full third of the 1.5 degree C aspirations being discussed by global leaders at this very moment. So now we just find the methane, go to there and stop it, right? It's a little easier said than done. The thing about methane is it kind of comes from everywhere. In fact, geochemical tools tell us that the majority of the methane skyrocketing in the atmosphere is from biological sources. Only around 10% of methane is ever present in a pipe, with just under 20% coming from the fossil energy sector as a whole. Nearly 30% comes from animal cultivation, for meat and dairy, or our waste stuffs like landfills and wastewater treatment. The remaining half derives from natural sources like wetlands and lakes, and the warming of the planet is poised to accelerate these emissions. Now the trouble with this reality is that most of these sources have no off switch. They are too dilute to simply light with a match. Somewhere between 80 and 90% of emissions will require treatment strategy that is radically different and can act on very low levels of methane, down to the 0.00018% that's present in the air that we're breathing. Now, if you ask an engineer to treat a dilute waste stream, the ones with any level of self-respect are going to run for the nearest exit. The reason that they're averse to this is because dilute waste streams are hard to react to a valuable product, and they're just plain hard to separate with any kind of economic benefit. 
Imagine trying to grab a methane molecule from in front of you. There are only two amongst the other million. Now, luckily, I have an ever-diminishing level of self-respect, and I was tracking methane emissions in the field and realized that we would be put in a position where we had to attack dilute methane sources. We'd have to do it in the presence of air and at relatively modest temperatures. And at this time, I remembered back to oceanography school. There, I learned about tiny microorganisms that live in the sediments underwater called methanotrophs, or methane lovers. Now, these little fellows have the ability to react methane at very low levels, in the presence of oxygen, at low temperatures, and convert that methane to drive their biological processes. So, my student, Rebecca Bernays, started digging into the literature to understand if we could mimic this capability abiotically, or simulate it in a way that we could manipulate as engineers. Now, the thing is, this particular type of chemistry is very hard to do. All the organisms in the world that do it use a highly conserved protein region to make it happen. Now, most of these regions have Earth-abundant metals, like copper or iron, in just the right arrangement in a very tiny pore space, or what biochemists might call an active site. But we couldn't just use the protein directly. These are hard to make in the volumes required by the scale of global change. They're expensive, and they often fail to work as soon as you pull them out of the host organism into any kind of engineered setting. So we looked to nature for other ways that we could pay homage to that bio-inspired active site using earth-abundant, low-cost materials. Now, if you walk outside later today and pick up a handful of dirt, soil, or dust, chances are you're going to be holding some clay alumina silicates. They make up a large fraction of the Earth's crust. And a particular type of this clay is called a zeolite. And it has several beautiful arrangements of pore spacings, potentially just tight enough to coax methane into CO2. Now, we use a simple process called ion exchange to introduce copper atoms into the structures. Remember, that's the same magic ingredient that's used by the methanotrophs to drive this process. Now, it turns out that other people had been trying this chemistry for many decades to turn methane into methanol, a liquid fuel that you could make into lots of other things. But there were a few problems. They didn't make enough methanol to economically separate it, a liquid, from the incoming gas stream. And what's more, these folks were using pretty high temperatures and pressures and pure oxygen or pure methane in rotation. Now, those are conditions my friends, the methanotrophs, would turn their tiny little backs on. So instead, we tried to do this chemistry the way that the problem demands and the way that nature insists, in the air we breathe, with low levels of methane at modestly elevated temperatures and the pressures we are experiencing here at the surface of the Earth. And you know what? It worked. This bio-inspired, earth-abundant powder was able to remove 99% of the methane in the air that we breathe catalytically. And it continued to work up to much higher concentrations of methane, but still too low to combust or ignite, like what comes from the breath of a cow or the depths of a coal mine. Those places are ideal for us because the methane there is enriched, which means the climate benefit for every packet of air that we move is maximized, and they represent major sources of methane to the atmosphere. If we could scale this technology and deploy it globally for enclosed farming and ventilated coal mining, fugitive emissions from landfills or gas production, it could be the equivalent of removing all of the combustion engine vehicles on the face of the Earth times three. Today, it remains to show that we can actually pull this off. <laughs> There's little to no limitation on the material side. Clay aluminous silicates abound, and copper doping them is facile. The catalyst, as it exists, can be made for somewhere between 15 and 85 cents per pound. That's commodity pricing. However, the flow rates of air at coal mines and large-scale dairy barns are astronomically high. The total movement at these places can be on the order of 500,000 to a million cubic feet per minute. Imagine 10 to 20 tractor trailers moving past you in the time it took me to say this sentence. That's the challenge that's on the table. Now, you might be asking, well, gosh, what kind of power does that require? 
Our goal is to ensure a net greenhouse gas benefit of 90% or more. In certain circumstances, where the methane is enriched above a half a percent, the energy needed to heat that incoming air is more than compensated for by the energy released by the reaction. Remember, the reason we use methane as a fuel in natural gas is because of the dense energy available in those CH bonds that I mentioned a little while ago. We're breaking those same bonds, and that chemistry could potentially fuel the entire process and even create electricity at the megawatt scale in certain environments. Now, this will require some ingenuity in reactor design and catalyst structuring to bring this to market before the decade is out. But it will take more than just a few dedicated professors and students to pull this off. Changing the rate of global warming by 2050 can uniquely be achieved through dramatic reductions in atmospheric methane levels right now. No amount of policy alone can do this quite simply because most methane emitted to the atmosphere has never seen the inside of a pipe. There is no tap to turn off. If we don't invest heavily in research and innovation to curb methane emissions, we will be standing at the end of 2030, potentially with no great reduction in atmospheric methane levels, and it could even be worse. Instead, we need a broad and distributed effort to target emissions from dairy and meat cultivation, coal and landfill emissions, wetlands and rice fields, and yes, pipelines and subterranean pipes in particular. We need high fidelity measures of methane reductions that can translate to value for our communities. And because we know emissions come from everywhere, we need direct conversion of methane at low levels present in the air that we breathe. In this way, we can use the strongest lever that we have to change the rate of climate forcing in our lifetimes to modulate the warming rate of a planet. That translates to measurable differences. Fewer extreme weather events, less dramatic drought and flood, fewer heat waves, and all the associated impacts on agriculture and biodiversity. In other words, this half a degree savings translates to a real benefit to the lived experience of people like you and people like me all around the globe.